All right, so as I mentioned before, you know, the fundamentals of reader response um, become increasingly important in a digital age. I'm double clicking here. Um, this, is a, this is a quote from the Lynn reading. The advent of hypertext underscores the value of reader response criticism, which authorizes and encourages readers of whatever sort of text to begin where really readers always must begin, with an individual response. And so in a way, reader response theorists are simply stating the obvious, right? We all are coming from a particular perspective when we approach a text. Um, and it's really interesting to me that he mentions hypertext fiction, particularly because he's writing this in 2008, and hypertext fiction is really like 10 years ago or so. Um, but I want to show you guys an example because I assume that you've not experienced. Um, some of you may have. But this is a, uh, this is a website, um, it's called The Distorted Barbie, and this is an example of it's not so much fiction as like a hypertext art project, but the idea is that you are literally using um, hypertext, which is of course a, a, um, a language used to written, write web pages, um, to create a type of text. So you give the reader um, options. You know, you can choose to navigate these links on the side. There are links over here that you can go through, um, and it you know takes you to different pages. And again, you can choose where you want to go, you can go forwards, you can go backwards. It's not like reading, you know, following a, a trail of breadcrumbs, um, page by page, um, like you think of a traditional book. This is the distorted Barbie, um, in case any of you guys are interested. It's, it's a really interesting art project, I think, and useful since we're in the, the Barbie movie right now. All right, so that's an example of hypertext. And like I said, hypertext is a little bit um, outdated in a way. Uh, again, I work with video games, and so technology has sort of exploded, right? Um, and we have all of these virtual environments where we can do a lot more and tell stories in, in, in really different ways. Um, this is another uh, screenshot of part of the fashion show. And, uh, you know, I want to sort of emphasize the point that we have lots of different ways to use technology um, to create text. Um, so computational media allow readers to play more active roles in the text. And there are various ways that it achieves this. The first is through what's known as avatar creation. Um, if you I don't know if you guys know what an avatar is, but um, sort of informal definition would be a digital, represent re digital representation of someone in a virtual world. Is that a, that a good one, Bella? Good. <laughs> Digital representation of a first name of a text, right? Um, how do you begin to write criticism about text that not everyone may have read at all? Um, you know, when you're writing about a book, you sort of expect that they went from page one to page you know, 273 all the way through without stopping or skipping around. Um, with a hypertext, you cannot have that kind of an expectation. Play. We've talked about play with Barbies already, um, but this applies to virtual worlds as well. Um, there are you know, places like Second Life where you have no specific roles, um, but you can you know, run around, dress yourself up with giant horns and wings um, if you choose an armor and stuff that I can't have in real life. Um, you, know, you can walk around the park, you can visit a virtual gardens, you can do all sorts of things in Second Life. Um, and that's that sort of freeform play the way of negotiating identities. It's a way of experimenting with, hey, what would it be like if I looked like Barbie um, in a virtual world? You can create a Barbie avatar and then go around and see how people react to you. Final thing is task completion. Um, when you think about video games, a lot of times they come with puzzles or goals, you know, go from here to here, fetch quests, get this thing, bring it back to me, and I'll let you go to the next part of the story. Um, and again, that's you know whether or not the user a decides to complete the task will affect um, which portions of the text uh, he or she will see. Um, it also uh, they also may complete the quest or complete the task in totally different ways, which will tell a different kind of story. Right now, the extent to which any of these things are narrative in nature is up for debate. Um, 
And there's no, you know, there's no real consensus here. But some of these things people don't consider um, to be sort of the purview of literary studies. Um, but we're having to confront the fact that people who play video games are experiencing a story, whether theorists like it or not. And we have to grapple with, um, you know, well, how do we look at these types of texts? <laughs> And the whole point of this sort of section and, and this transition from the real to the virtual that I want you guys to think about, um, not only because it's my field and I like sharing my field with other people and it's really cool and I hope you guys get more interested in it, um, you're actually at a university and in an English department in particular that's very progressive with how we define text and how we, how we look at text. So you're in a great place if you're interested in this sort of stuff. Um, but texts that span virtual worlds offer us new ways to explore storytelling potentials um, and to test the limits of literary devices, much like our thought experiment with Barbies as text allowed us to do before. So as a literary critic, I can look at a virtual world. Um, in fact, we have Bala in the back here. He's doing his dissertation on looking at virtual worlds um, as a sort of text. So we're sort of trying to expand our notion of what literature means, expand what a text means, and how we can read it. Because again, whether or not we like it, people are reading these things in certain ways, um, and it's time for us to um, see what it's doing. How, how do these things create meaning, and how can we harness them to be more effective um, meaning producers? All right, so this is sort of summing up the entire lecture. I'm going to give you a couple key phrases, okay? And sticking with the theme of games, um, this is new game, old rules. All right, so we went from poetry to prose. And now these two forms may look quite different, um, but the mechanics operate in much the same way. And I hope I showed you sufficient examples to kind of make you aware that you need to hold on to the stuff that we learned already in the quarter. Transition from text to object. Um, Barbie functions as a literary de device as much within the text as she does independent of it. Bodies can be text too, as can virtual worlds, as can games, etc., etc. Um, again, we're looking to expand our notion of what literature means and see what that does for literature. <coughs> the transition from new criticism to reader response. Um, pay close attention to your personal responses, but also consider social, cultural, and very importantly, the textual codes at play. This is not writing a journal entry about your personal experience with this text. We have to take it to another level and make it a little more sophisticated and a little more analytical than that. Um, not that you guys don't have brilliant thoughts um, when you read, but we need to sort of mix it in um, with, uh, you know, for, for the new critics, rest their souls a bone, right? All right, and our transition from the real to the virtual is taking reader response to its limits. Um, and so I was trying to show you some examples of, of you know, how um, this reader response becomes more important in the, in the stakes are totally changed um, in the virtual world. And that's going to be my conclusion now, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Um, I hope I didn't move too fast, and we covered a lot, um, and I don't know if the professor has any questions.